fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. Of course, I'm Al Warren. Now, make room. We've got the the Martino <laughs> kid is back. I have returned. Wow. My, it's been, a, my it's triumphant been like return. a couple of weeks. Like, what's going on? Yeah, I took some time off. You're not allowed to do that. I haven't even I had time off yet this year. How come you had time <laughs> off? What's going on? I know. Royalty. It's here. terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. I mean, what, <laughs> what were you doing with your time off? I saw I saw another one of those uh, Kung Fu reels or whatever. Oh, you yeah. Were showing, well, put... You were showing someone how you were, you were beating up an old man. Oh, that's my dad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's back from 2010. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We used to train <laughs> together. <laughs> you, you beat up your dad? Yeah, for fun. Why? Not profit, but, you know, it'd be oh. good if it was fun and profit. Yeah, you need to make yeah. money off. I, I make <laughs> money off of beating the old man. Oh, man. Can you imagine? Oh, I'm wow. getting them back. Getting them back for all the, yeah, back. the extra pokes and bangs <laughs> and stuff like that, you know? Now, now, do you guys wear underwear in those uniforms? Yes. Well, well I guess you have to. Yeah. You're jumping around, right? You don't want to get any, yeah. any stuff. Yeah, you, gotta, you, get a, you need a home, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, the kid, I know how far under, I wanted to go with that. <laughs> you got to, yeah, you got to keep it under control. Yes. Right? So, uh, but all... anyway, so Tina Turner passed, which is, you know, yes. first we talked about that's just sad, you know. But I guess, yeah. we, you know, I guess she'd been ill for a little while. But it's always hard when you see a, a tough person, yeah, to kick it. And uh, Tommy Chong turned eighty-five. Eighty-five. Wow. Eighty-five, and I celebrate him wow. because he listens to the show and he uh, yeah. sends messages all the time. Um, That's great, but we wish him well too. He's he's been yeah. fighting with colon cancer, so oh, wow. you know the treatment and stuff like that. And of course, Cardi B, my girl. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Cardi B making comments on me. Ooh, I feel I feel really. Yeah, WAP. I'm, I'm a wet ass pussy. <laughs> I don't. It's like wow. I wow. hope she doesn't go back to that show when we played that. We played the theme of that song throughout the whole show subtly in the background. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, because like, it was Brian Turnoff was the, and we were talking about I forget what, what it was about, but it was really hilarious because we had that. Oh, because she won Woman of the Year. Oh, I was yeah, yeah, yeah. That you have a song called that, and you win Woman of the Year. <laughs> like things have changed, <laughs> big time. Anyway, now speaking of Woman of the Year, we have an author, and uh, you know, and he's got a new book out, and it's for Rattling Good Yarns. Press. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course, the new book is called "Goes On Without the World's Understanding." So, uh, Mr. Thomas Westerfield, thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, Thomas, how did you get in the position of writing this book? Like, what what led you to decide I'm going to write a book and about this subject? Well, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Saints and Sinners Festival, a literary festival in New Orleans. A couple of years, well, actually longer than a couple of years ago, but about uh, 2016, uh, I wrote my first short story after a 29-year lag. Uh, I hadn't written anything uh, like that for 29 years, but I wrote a short story. Uh, it placed as a finalist. And they published the story, and uh, that just started me writing again. And in 2018, uh, the the Literary Festival is a great festival, uh, primarily for LGBT writers. And um, they offer opportunities to meet publishers to pitch book ideas. And I had a collection over the years of uh, stories that I'd written, oh, God, even some stories that I'd written 50 years ago. 
had collected. And then I had started writing some more after I wrote this first story that placed as a finalist. Uh, that story is called Mr. Sissy in Sin City, and that's included in Goes On Without the World's Understanding. So um, th- that particular publisher was not interested in my idea, <laughs> but it fired for me the idea of writing of writing the book. And I wanted to write stories. It's the old thing. I wanted to write stories that I wanted to read. Fifty years ago, you don't you don't look old enough to be writing 50 years ago. <laughs> I started when I was, well, actually, I really started writing when I was 11 years old. Um, I, I tell this story in the acknowledgement section. My father was um, a Navy man who retired, and then he was a construction worker, a fireman, and then he was the first male librarian in Davis County, Kentucky. And so I showed him a short story I wrote uh, where the the character blackmails the world into world peace by holding all the power of a nuclear bomb. And I showed him this story that I, that I had written and he pulled out his pencil and on top of the page, he wrote out how that story would appear in a card catalog of the old card catalogs that they had at the library. And it was such a I think he was just being playful, but for me, that was a mind-blowing experience of, oh, my God, I could write something that could be part of that vast, vast rooms of endless shelves that had all these books on them, including the books that I was that I checked out. So uh, that just kind of uh, really did push me to, to do a lot of writing, short stories, uh, plays, failed novels, screenplays. Uh, the whole nine yards. Well, I thought at first you you were going to um, tell us your dad was part of the village people until he got to being a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yes, that, that's very true. Yeah, he had he, he had several uh, different um, jobs, held several different jobs over the years. Did you have a a, a point or a purpose to this book? Like did, when you sat down and put together these stories. Was there something you wanted the reader to take away from it? Well, I wanted to take some things that I, I feel like in our current culture, it seems like there's certain um, tropes and certain uh, ways that we are expected to write about subjects now. And, for example, in one of the stories, one of the first stories of the collection is called Surviving. And it's about a men's group, therapy group of uh, sexual abuse and incest survivors. And so in that story, what I wanted to do was show that there's not one type of trauma. There's not one type of victim. There's not one particular way or better way of surviving. And I wanted to get that broad range where people may actually crack a joke, where people may say, well, yes, This thing happened. I didn't like it, but I'm not as traumatized as you're expecting me to be. Or where there's also, of course, the people who have been crushed by it. Uh, And then those people who have suffered and yet also use it perhaps as a, um, I don't know, a get out of jail free card. So uh, for bad behavior. So I wanted to really just capture a whole range of what people who have had that experience are like and so there's that there so again it's just that things are a little bit more complex a little bit more layered a little bit more uh uh nuanced and not there's just not one way that you, you can write about such a character and that was that was like and that there's that idea it goes through a lot of the stories where did you come up with the ideas that you used in the story is there some live personal stuff in involved or is it just all uh fictional in your mind like where where do the stories come from well of course there's there's 13 stories uh in the collection so again that's also its own range but even with stories that might begin with some kind of uh either autobiographical basis or uh, maybe based on people that i know eventually all the stories become fiction they be, they become when the, it's very important to me that even if the character is based in something real 
or the situation is based on something real, that eventually it takes on its own life. It becomes in some ways separate for me and the characters. There's nothing better for a writer, I think, than when your characters say and do things in the moment that you're writing that you yourself didn't know they were going to say or do. That That's the greatest part. And I really don't trust my stories until I have some place where that is happening. Uh, and that way, then I know it's not, uh, it's certainly never totally going to be totally autobiographical. It's going to be these people in this situation. Um, and then I, I guess I, I do have a kind of active imagination that uh, creates things in my head. And I just kind of turn them over and turn them over and turn them over until I finally just have to sit down and finally write it, write it out. Well, I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned tropes. Did you find any motifs um, that maybe kept reappearing in your stories as you wrote out these 13 uh, different uh, tales? Well, it, it, um, I was very lucky that I found this title of Goes On Without the World's Understanding because it, it's from a, a long Tennessee Williams passage in a short story called Oriflame, uh, which he wrote back in the 1940s and then was included in his the uh, 1980 collected stories. And I, the thing that is, it's that things happen. Uh, there's all sorts of things happen <laughs> in life and into people's life. It's that the idea that none of us really knows anyone's life and that uh, stuff goes on that the world just doesn't understand. Uh, and then that then the people who have these experiences – in some ways, uh, they find their way to also go on, uh, and the world doesn't understand that either. So uh, I, I think it's that the mystery and complexities and the wonderful people really can never be pinned down. No, no matter how much you try, uh, you can't pin down uh, human experience and the human soul and the human spirit uh, in all of its range. Uh, it, it just doesn't, it, it just isn't, um, it can't be encapsulated in, in a simple way. So the, so the idea that all of these things are happening in life, he, and like in some of my stories, there's sex trafficking and there's mm -hmm. murder, suicide, there's, uh, uh, racial conflict, there's inter, intergenerational conflict, uh, there's love won, love lost. Again, it all goes on without the world's understanding. Yeah, it's it's um it's hard to be pinned down, but you can be tied up. Um, <laughs> now, well, we tie ourselves in knots, that's for sure. <laughs> we do that to ourselves all the time, don't we? Yeah, all the time. It's more about what we think than you know. It's all in our mind. Um, is is there a particular story of the thirteen that um you're most proud of? Well, I will tell you this, uh, um, two of the stories, uh, Mr. Sissy and Sin City, which is about a retired teacher in his 60s who's uh, at the uh, roulette table late at night in Las Vegas, and he's joined by a very drunken young 21-year-old who's by himself. Uh, that is a very, that seems to be a very uh, big favorite of of people and um it's also i think just very beautifully contained about these two very different people having this encounter uh and then i i also like um uh, the barbies in the closet which is about a little boy who's at that age of seven or eight where you know what's reality and what's pretend and yet your pretend especially your fears um you can kind of still give yourself over to them. So I love that story. And then the, the story I was mentioning is surviving. It, it is uh, at the beginning of the book. And the last story of the uh, book is called his, his father. And that continues surviving with the protagonist and his father um, spending a quiet Sunday evening. And the father was the one who sexually abused him. So those four stories, I think, um, each are very unique and each really, again, it captures that wide range of what I was talking about, the variety of human experience and how people go through it. Are you are you hoping to do um, more than just one of these style of books? Were you going to do some more maybe? Well, I am working on a, another book uh, where it's a novella 
um, called That Goddamned Red Rose. Uh, and I don't want to really get into what that's going to be about, but there will also be three stories, uh, short stories in that book, uh, including one called um, uh, Not a Very Nice Person. Uh, it's a story that we decided not to put into Goes On because it was more of a uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, nastier and meaner story and bitter story than uh, I felt perhaps maybe wasn't quite as compassionate or as, as gentle as, uh, or as loving as the other stories were and goes on. So that, that'll get included. But yeah, that's, that's a book that I'm currently working on. Do you feel that you're um, a natural short story writer or have you considered eventually um, expanding out to novels? Well, I, I, you know what? I think I don't, ha I've tried novel writing and I, I haven't come up with, an idea that is really sustainable for, say, 200, 250 pages even. I have written plays. I have written full-length plays. And um, again, and on my website, thomaswesterfieldwriter.com, I do have a, a, a PDF of my play Monasteries, which was uh, written in the 1980s. It was produced at Southern Illinois University and won the second prize of the uh, Julie Harris Beverly Hills Theater Guild Playwriting Award. And I did write in the 80s and 90s, I wrote several plays, full length and uh, short uh, one acts. But for I, I, I took a detour and I, I stopped writing for about, oh my goodness, probably 12 to 15 years where I wasn't writing anything. And uh, getting back to writing with uh, Mr. Sissy and Sin City, the short stories have just have flowed so much easier. And I think it's because um, I heard a great thing from the author, Erica Young. I don't know if you remember her from uh, Fear of Flying, uh, but she was giving a talk and she said the obvious thing, but it's the thing that really struck me in a fresh way that the your job as a writer is to keep the reader turning the page. And I think with short stories, they're so focused. They so you have to get to where you're going. And of course, you can have some lovely sentences, but it's really about just starting the story, telling the story, and and letting this go to its natural end. And I think also, too, frankly, uh, not readers. I think readers are a different breed of audience. But I do know that I, I think the audience nowadays doesn't I, I i think focus i think that idea of of steady consistent focus on one thing seems to be eroding so i think mm -hmm. short stories actually are a really great form for for a lot of uh new readers especially well yeah you would definitely think that people uh, readers themselves would spend uh you know more time reading short fiction just because of lowered attention spans and uh Totally encapsulated. I'm curious, why um, why was there a gap? Why did you um, walk away from writing for a period of time? Well, I ended up, uh, unfortunately, my plays never really took off. They would win <laughs> second prize in contest. Uh, I did get produced. Uh, one play did get produced in Chicago, and that was, uh, to be honest, it was just a crushing experience because uh, it, the casting the casting was changed without me knowing that it was going to be changed. And it was just a terrible production. And I, I felt so defeated because I thought oh, this is my entryway, you know, to be produced in a, in a nice theater in Chicago. So so that was kind of crushing. And then the other things that I was writing after that, just nobody was really responding to. And then it becomes that issue of survival. I mean, you know, I need I need health insurance. Right. <laughs> and when you when you go into a job, I, I was working for a lot of law firms as a uh, legal billing coordinator. Um, I ended up working at a couple of law, international law firms with a lot of corporate clients. And that kind of job just simply doesn't allow a lot left over. So at the end of the day, there wasn't really anything to, you know, that you didn't even have the desire to give. And I also kind of gave up the dream of like, oh, I'm going to get published or somehow I'm going to find an audience. I just kind of let that die out. I always found that um, you got to sleep your way to the top. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I, I would I, I would love to have tried that method. I probably might have gotten by with it when I was younger, but, <laughs> but but once you hit your sixties, it's a little harder to pull off. Well, you just give them a picture of Dave, and then you do it. You know, it has to be really dark when you meet them. They don't know. Well, you know, when you mentioned your characters earlier, and how when you you said when you started to hear them and they sort of see where they go and stuff like that. So maybe describe or explain what your let's say, um, personal experiences with your characters, um, your relationship? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I end up, I always end up in some ways, in some some situations, I actually I'll sometimes end up wishing I was as good of a person as some of my characters are. And I sometimes am, am very, I have a compassion for the ones that even if I, I think they're in some ways, but I don't think anybody's irredeemable, but I have had characters that I, I kind of pull away from or, or can't fully embrace. But even with them, I feel that uh, just that sense of their humanity. And I really spend a lot of time just thinking in my head before, again, before I just, before I write, but I just want to, it's not really what they look like or even sound like, but it's almost like that, uh, you know, how you meet people, you just have a visceral sense of who they are or what they're about. And that's really what I try to focus on is just uh, whenever that, that idea for a story or that idea for a character comes through is just what's my visceral, visceral sense about who is this person? Are they somebody I want to spend time with? Are they somebody I want to get to know? Are they a mystery I want to solve? Are they, do they have a sense of humor? And so that usually comes fairly quick. Uh, and then the situation that I, I put them in, I, I just do I, I, so much. It's funny. I, I It's almost like a pregnancy of sorts that I have like three or four story ideas that keep rolling around in my brain over and over again. And oftentimes, to tell you the truth, I'll even write the first, the opening sentence, even the opening paragraph in my head before I actually sit down and actually put it out on paper. So when you're doing the dialogue and you're putting it together, do you hear the voices of the characters? I do. I, I can. I, I have a sense of the volley of back and forth between people, it, and and sometimes it's more vivid than others. Uh, yeah, that that that's uh, some, it's interesting because it's so hard to explain. I, I'm sure you understand this as a writer yourself, but it becomes it's it, it is an alternate reality. It is. It's it's it, I'm immersed in their world. And I love being surprised by what they're saying. So, uh, yeah, it's very easy to uh, to hear them and to uh, once there's a rhythm going, especially in terms of conflict or in terms of that, that thing where, of course, we have we say things, but there's something underneath of what we're saying. Uh, when I'm in those situations with the character, it flows out real easy. Does this happen um a lot when you're driving? Uh, you know, I don't drive. I've never had, I've never had, I've never had a driver's license. Well, thank God. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, I, I, I have a, I have a driving phobia. I think it's because my mother, was, she got her driver's license when she was pregnant with me. That's, that's what I think happened. But I've never, no, I've never, never driven. Well, that's good. You know, if you're hearing voices, you shouldn't be driving. <laughs> you're right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, and it is t funny because sometimes I, I know that when I'm walking, uh, I, I will, without realizing that I am, I am, the characters are dialoguing out loud <laughs> and I'm not aware of it until I look at other people. That's happened before. I, I, I'd like to go back to one thing, though, if I, if I could, because you asked me about why I had stopped writing. I, like I said, I was working uh, for these, this law firm has a billing coordinator and it was incredibly, uh, I mean, I was, it wasn't until I left it that I realized how much I was actually working, but I got sick in uh, the Christmas, the, the week between Christmas 2010 and New Year's Day 2011 with what I thought was a cold. And then I thought was the flu. And then as my lungs started shutting down, I realized it was pneumonia. I was put in a medically induced coma for about 10 days. And when I woke up, it was two weeks later from when I had walked into the emergency room. And I had a little bit, it, it did take a while. I had a little bit of cognitive, um, oh, not, I wouldn't say cognitive decline, but just 
cognitive difficulty uh, with memory. And my job was so uh, so much about synthesizing information very quickly. So I actually took an early retirement uh, on disability, and it took a couple of years. I, I started writing when, when, again, I heard about the Saints and Sinners Festival in New Orleans, and they, they had a contest, and I just thought, you know, why not try it? Just why not try it? And they were the, the title was, uh, again, Saints and Sinners, so I was trying to figure out what's the theme there. And at that, that time, um, I had a trip to Las Vegas planned, and so when I was in Vegas, that's where the whole idea for that story came came back to me. And And after that, I think... Of the 13 stories, I think seven of them were were since that that time in 2016 when I I, I began writing with uh, our uh, the contest for Saints and Sinners. That's what that's what started me off and and being retired <laughs> that that really helps uh, for your for the writing time. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, Saints and Sinners. I, I've been asked to go. I, I never have. I oh, you should definitely go. Definitely go. Well, something about New Orleans that just sort of... Uh, Dave was uh, dancing there a while back. Yes. Four years ago. That's me now. Yeah, it was really, <laughs> it was really scary. <laughs> I had to entertain all of New Orleans. Yeah, you did. Somebody has to do it. I certainly did. I saw you. <laughs> still, still shaking. So, do you like do you like the live show sort of thing? Will you be doing more book shows and and things like that now that you've got this book out? Well, I, I do like reading. I, I in uh, 2020, right, like literally the week before the pandemic lockdown started in San Francisco, I had a reading at a bookstore here of my story surviving, and. Uh, I do like reading. I'm a little bit of a performer. I, I, there was a course I took a long time ago in graduate school called uh, Writing Has Performance, uh, which I really like that title and that idea because in a way writing is or can be, not always, but it, it can be a, for, a form of performance, a, a way of acting. And uh, so I love telling a story. And when it's my story, I love reading my story. And I Get very and I, I was very happy. The audience was very responsive, so I do I do like doing live readings. Were you taking your clothes off too at the same time? Uh, no, again at sixty nine <laughs> and uh, let's see, two hundred and ten pounds. I I think that might not have. Uh, I don't think that's what the audience came for. Well, just, you said they were responsive, so I thought, well, maybe there's some action going on here. I don't no, it was all my it was all my writing and all my reading of the writing that did it. So. See, I'm not used to that, man. I'm I'm wearing a bikini out there. <laughs> so now, after doing all of this, you know, you completed the book, you got the stories out there, it's published, it's done, and all that stuff. And looking back before you did it, compared to now today. How do you think this process has changed you? That is that is such an excellent, excellent question. And I think it has changed me in that I I think I'm more clear in myself about what I want to be doing with the act three of my life, with what's important. And, and writing is certainly an essential part of that. But I'm also just aware of... I have an appreciation for my past. I have an appreciation for the people of my past, uh, family, certainly, and a great, great history of friends. And that gratitude and that appreciation and that kind of just, I mean, it's, I am so sorry to use a cliche on you all, but it, it is, there is a miracle about being alive. And I feel so alive when I'm creating yeah, I'd much rather be doing that the next, uh, the final. I, I'm 69, so that means my chances of being dead in 20 years are superb. My my next 20 years, I think my my time will be both more used more wisely, and certainly with a lot more uh, joy and appreciation. Well, do you think writing has been therapeutic for uh, your recovery for when it comes to your cognitive ability? That's a good question too. I I, I think it. It gives me uh, because I have to focus. Uh, it it does. Uh, it, it's sometimes I, I will be honest. I have maybe two or three good hours where I can really do intense, you know, solid writing. 
around the fourth hour, it gets a little mushy. Uh, so I need to, you know, take a break from it for at least, oh God, you know, a nap, uh, two or three hours of doing something else. Uh, and then they get, then I get a kind of new wind and a, and a fresh mind again. So I, I definitely think it forces my mind to work. And someone told me it's interesting because I have a lot of trouble taking in information and synthesizing and understanding. But there's a whole different set of uh, your brain gets used when you're putting out information. And, and especially with writing, which demands, at least on the keyboard, a kind of coordination. So that's actually been very good for my cognitive abilities, but I'm not sure it hasn't improved my ability to take in and understand lots of information at, at one time. I still get kind of overwhelmed with that, but in terms of giving me my, my brain uh, a little bit more clarity, focus, energy, yes, writing definitely, definitely has, has been a great thing. I uh, think the other thing is I'm going to just uh, throw this in too. I don't know if you uh, noted this in my uh biography but i'm also i mean even though i'm writing about all these things murder suicide sexual abuse uh conflict and everything i'm actually a certified laughter yoga leader which i'm not sure if you're familiar with laughter yoga but it's a form of exercise that uses laughter has your kind of breath work that certainly was a big help for me cognitively uh especially in the uh getting out of the coma and the drugs I was on and just, yeah, laughter is a good thing. Laughter for no other reason than just for the sake of laughing is something I very, very much believe in. Sounds like these, these stories, each one of them is, it's kind of has a very important meaning to you. Is is there a subtext to each one of them? Like, is there something you want it to say? I think it's just, I want people to something to resonate with people in their own lives and with the people in their own lives and their experiences to where maybe they look at it from a different perspective, a different way of seeing that they haven't seen before. Something that just kind of, that that maybe, yes, there's tragedy and there's suffering. I I never deny tragedy and suffering. And there's still something within the tragedy and suffering that just because it is human and just because it's life itself, it should be, I'm not sure if embrace is the word, but can be accepted, can be made peace with. Um, I think that's just really, yeah, that's, that's very important with important to me. I also, uh, one of the stories is called the boy in the audience and it takes place in 1971 Kentucky where a, closeted gay teenager goes to uh, see the movie The Boys in the Band, the the original 1970 film. It's funny because uh, for so many years, you know, a lot of um, gay activists considered, you know, The Boys in the Band has, you know, retrograde and uh, uh, negative and full of self-hate and, you know, the wrong story or the wrong image for gay people. But I, I got into the... For me, the idea for someone in Kentucky being introduced to gay life through a movie, which so much of us, not just gay life, but just so much of life were introduced through movies and books. But for this character, what he's not, he's not responding to the self-hate of the, the characters. He's responding to the fact that they're affectionate, that they, they dance, that they laugh with each other, that they get drunk with each other and have these big dramatic scenes, which seems very exciting you know to do that in a in a in a new york apartment that has a you know uh uh patty outside patio overlooking the city so uh it, it's the idea that some of these things which we're told are wrong or bad or aren't good for us or that we're supposed to have a specific response to i like writing those things that are about that kind of go against that grain and i i, I hope that in some ways like I said, the reader gets to reflect for themselves about some of their own experiences uh, that are similar and that they maybe have a just maybe a little bit of a different appreciation or perspective about their experiences. Yeah, I guess um, it, it probably surprises you on how backwards sort of the country is going towards some of the uh, LGBTQ um, thoughts. 
you know, uh, and stuff like that. To perhaps something like this will be a, a good influence. Well, I, 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 to be honest, I personally, for myself, just speaking for myself, I hate fiction that tries to make me a better person. Um, I don't mind fiction that tries to make me a different person. Uh, and it's always a great side benefit if it makes me a better person. But it's not about learning lessons as much as, as much as it's about discovering oneself and and knowing and maybe expanding your heart a little bit towards others. That would be a great thing. Uh, I think what's going on in the culture right now, um, it's it's that whole thing, uh, you know, where we take two steps forwards and at least one, if not two or three steps back. So it's very hard to figure out exactly what's going on. I know for myself, I don't know if you have this experience when you talk to young people in their 20s, sometimes I'm just absolutely in awe of them. I'm just amazed at how much smarter and insightful and purposeful and committed they are, or at least some of them are. Uh, and then sometimes I see and talk to 20 years old, 20 year olds, and I really collect recognize how I was in 20 years at 20 year 20 years old. And then other times it's like, oh my God, you people are just like really uh, too uh, precious or too, uh, you know, just just too hung up on the wrong thing. <laughs> so uh, it, it's such a bizarre culture right now, I think. Um, I, I It's hard to say where we're going. And um, I have hope generally but I think we are all the, the struggles. It, it's interesting to see these struggles are coming back uh, and, and these conflicts are coming back. And uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't think I, I don't think my stories offer us a way out, except maybe, again, opening our hearts a little bit more to the complexity of, of each human. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm talking in cliches right now, so I apologize. <laughs> That's all right. Now, now let's talk about uh, where people can find Thomas. Like, um, you hanging out in bars? Do you have social media, Facebook? Do you have a website? Uh, hookup apps? Where do they Where do they find Thomas? Well, you can find uh, my website, ThomasWesterfieldWriter dot com. I actually uh, do not use social media. I think. For example, like with Twitter, I think the idea of me having something which allows me to broadcast to the world the very first thought that comes to my mind, I think would be just a total disaster. So I, I totally avoid Twitter. And I I, I think social media it, it is a very useful tool in especially in terms of promotion and publicity. And, and, I, and I'm certainly hypocritical enough to uh, exploit my friends who use and have social media. But but for myself, I, I see sometimes social media is kind of a, it can be a black hole. And again, as I reach a certain age, I'd rather spend my time reading, writing, being with friends and family rather than doing Instagram likes or, like I said, broadcasting my opinion on, on every little thing. But you can go to my website, thomaswesterfield.com, that tells you my book. It has my play monasteries. It gives you a little bit of a biography. And it does uh, have an email address if you would like to contact me for, I don't know, anything. Uh, you want to give me comments about the books. I had a teacher once who, when he would end his lessons, he would ask, say, comments, questions, or snide remarks. So I don't want the snide remarks, but if you have comments or questions, I'd love to hear from uh, readers. And also, too, if people, uh, I'm trying to start developing a little bit of a side thing where people, after I've gone through this process of writing and learning so much about publishing, especially some of the smaller publishing houses, and I did a big research. I was so, I want to be say how grateful I am to Rattling Good Yarns Press because I was rejected from uh, 12 to 16 other small presses, but they took on the book within one month. I mean, I sent it, sent it to them, they read it, and within a month, they they signed up and they were willing to take it on. So I'm very grateful for them. But anyway, if someone is interested in writing a book or, or kind of negotiate or navigate the waters 
of getting published, I'm sort of glad to uh, help assist them for price, of course, but I'm very be, be helpful in that way. Well, so um, we'll have all that up on our website. People can find you with one click. It'll be real easy. So uh, what, what's next? Where, where's Thomas going now? Well, uh, actually, I have a cousin from Kentucky who's in uh, Oakland waiting for me to come visit him. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, it's, it's the book. I think the book. And then also, too, I'm very happy. I'm going to go to Rome in the October. I've never been to Italy. And so um, that's going to be great. And I'm also doing a lot of uh, outreach, especially during the month of June. Uh, but one thing with a small press, they, uh, Rattling Good Yarns does do some promotion, but a lot of it is just me doing footwork and one-on-one -on -one contact, trying to get readings at bookstores in the Bay Area, uh, trying to get interviews from different presses. And reaching out, like I said, uh, even though I don't use social media, I'm glad to exploit those who do. So, so I'm making a lot of one-on-one -on -one contacts to friends and family and people large, um, far and wide. So that's really my big project for the next month. Well, fantastic. Our guest has been Thomas Westerfield, and his book that's just come out is called Goes On Without the World's Understanding. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I enjoy this a lot more. As I, I, as I told you earlier uh, in the pre-interview, uh, I've never done a radio interview before, especially at this length. So I do feel like I, I lost my virginity, but it was a very pleasurable experience. So thank you very much. <laughs> You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.